Who's excited about 2019? Are you really? Who's tired? <laughs> I know you feel like you sort of, you know, you cross the finish line, you finish, and it's like, oh no. Now I've got to start all over again. And I have noticed that as I've, I've gotten a little bit older, I've started to lose my, a little bit of my childlike enthusiasm. It's, it's chipped away. You know, and, uh, and you know, you sort of, you, you know, sort of feel like, like the, like the time of year sort of looks like this hill that you got to climb again. But I will say, from my point of view as the minister, we had a fantastic ending of the year. Oh, uh, the, the Reynolds family uh, joined, uh, rejoined the church this morning. Uh, and we were so happy about just the way the church has been going and the things that have been happening here that they they moved their membership to the church, but then they moved their membership back here, so that's awesome. And we had a family that, uh, we had a couple that heard a commercial, the radio commercial. How many of you heard the radio commercial that Ken, that Ken Reeves has recorded? Can I uh, share? What? Can I share? Share. Yeah, I was listening to the radio, and I heard this guy talking about this church, and I thought, gosh, that sounds like, that sounds like our church, but... I wonder if it's just like the way churches are going now. And then eventually he said, first Christian church. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a woman in our in our Sunday school class and she's new to the church this year. And just so thrilled to, to find a church. She didn't think she could find a church that was really welcoming and loving and receiving and open minded and all those things. She was traveling to different cities. Uh, to on the to try to find a church that she could go to, and then she and she found this church, and she just oh just loves, you know that's one of the nice things about being a minister is you get to meet these people who are just you're just it's like they had just found the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> you're going around trying to find stuff like oh that part fell off that didn't work. You know you're always like, trying to fix stuff, and so the church to you can kind of look like a like an old car you're trying to keep going. But then somebody comes along and they just think it's beautiful. They think it's a Lamborghini. They think it's the most beautiful thing they've ever seen in their entire life. It's so blown away that there's a church, that there's a church like this. So anyway, that commercial, uh, there was a couple that came that heard that. Oh, I was going to tell you that lady that was in the Sunday school class. She was, you know, just feeling really good about the church. And she was listening to the radio and the commercial came on. And she said, man, that sounds like a good church too. And it's like, wait a second, that's my church. Yeah. And uh, this is the church, this is the church where everybody gets welcomed and received and made to feel encouraged. I talked to a person one time who said that uh, they had been going to this church, but then they 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 uh, stopped going. For instance, I go to church every Sunday. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much every Sunday. Um, but, you know, there are some people that kind of fall out of the pattern of going to church, and they miss a Sunday or two Sundays or three Sundays or whatever. And um, they miss so many Sundays that, the, that they got a letter from the church which said, you are no longer a member of this church because they missed too many. They missed, not our church. I just want you to know, we do not have that letter. We do not have, there is no, I mean, once you start going here, especially once you join this church, you are a member, even if even if you don't show up, you're still considered to be a member. If your family goes into the hospital or you have a death in the family and you need to help from the church, guess how we treat you? Just the same as if you came every Sunday. Everybody is equally loved. Everybody is equally valued, no matter uh, how often you you know how often you, you happen to come here. So. Let's talk a little bit about getting excited about 2019. Let me help you to try to find your excitement. I think about people that help groups of people find excitement. I think of coaches. I had a, I didn't do I didn't do a lot of sports. I did band. Man, I had a band. I had a band director that could help you find your excitement. We could start at the beginning of the year and you get fired up now about being in a band. I mean, that sounds kind of funny, but he was just a really commanding personality. Now, the, the, the greatest coach of all time 
is arguably Pat Summit. Uh, the uh, Pat Summit, the University of Tennessee uh, lady uh, basketball. Lady have you ever heard of Pat Summit? Yeah. Most people have heard. Most people have heard of her. Mother went to the University of Tennessee, and my parents met at the University of Tennessee. So I feel some connection. So uh, Pat Summit has passed away. And toward the end of her uh, coaching career, she very rarely did public speaking engagements. She spoke, uh, she gave three public speaking engagements per year. And I get here more. And she said that she would gather her team together at the beginning of the year. And she would say, team, what is your goal for this year? So imagine you're on Pat Summit's team, and she says to you, what is your goal for this year? What are you going to say back to Coach Summit? To win the national championship. That's what she was waiting for. And she said that she had to do this exercise. She said, because you cannot coach somebody towards a goal that they don't want for themselves. She said, I never tried to get somebody to do something that they didn't want to do, but I always helped them to do something that they wanted to do. She said, This is really important because one of the things that you have to do to play basketball is run and run and run some more. And she said, Sometimes they would be doing their going through the running part of the practice, which was not the most fun part, and they would, they would just be slowing down. And uh, Pat Summit would say, you guys want to be national champions? And they would say, yes, Coach Summit. And then she would say, well, you're not running like you want to be national champions. So what she did was she encouraged them to believe, to be who they believed themselves to be. Okay. Now, what was Jesus excited about? Now you could think that Jesus was excited about like converting people or changing people's minds. Uh, like that he thought that was like if he, gets, if, he, if he could convert somebody or change somebody's mind. But I think the root excitement of Jesus is about the heavenly father. If you try to understand what motivated Jesus was he was overwhelmed with the goodness and the beauty of his heavenly Father. I don't know if any of you have had a, a parent, an overwhelmingly wonderful parent, but just imagine a child that is just out of their mind because their parent is so good, so incredibly wonderful, and that this child is just zeroed in on that parent and loves nothing more than the face of the parent and loves nothing more and telling everybody else about the day. That is, that's what's going on in Christ. And that's what he's wanting to share with the world. And this is what he thinks has gotten lost in all of the rules and the regulations and the traditions that have been developed over time. That those things have clouded the minds of the people about the, the true identity and how good the Heavenly Father really was. So Jesus' job was to come into the world and to reacquaint people with the Heavenly Father. And just let him know, let everybody know how wonderful. If if you're the reason that Jesus Jesus' motivation was so strong is because he was just purely motivated by love for his heavenly father. That's why he did everything. He wasn't, Jesus, I don't think, was trying to be spiritual. He was just living in this wonderful relationship that he had with his heavenly father. And he was just sharing that with everybody else. And along the way, he taught people how to pray. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get into the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to take back up the Sermon on the Mount as we get started this year. So we're in the sixth chapter of Matthew. Uh, we, we made it all the way through chapter five of the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'd like you to now, if you can, please get out a Bible or get out your phone or get out uh, something and just look at Matthew uh, 6, 9 with me. I consider it a personal victory if somebody just opens the Bible and finds something. And so if you can just open your Bible or put your phone down and just find Matthew 6, 9, then you pass the sermon. Not to say that if you don't, you fail the sermon. But uh, what I'm wanting you to do is look at the text with me. Um, have you been to an art museum? Imagine if you were a docent at an art museum and you had studied this painting. And your job 
was to explain the pain to people so that they could appreciate it. And so you got everybody together, and uh, it was time for you to explain the pain, and there was just one person who used to admit it. And that you were talking, but they wouldn't look at the pain. So what, I, what I'm trying to get everybody to do is look at the text with me together. And so I, what, I, what I like to see is when I'm preaching is people doing this. You know, looking down, you know, looking down at the, looking down at the text. Somebody, one time somebody told me, when you're preaching, sometimes I read ahead. Oh. <laughs> Hurt me. So Dave Sims has a good question. What if it's not in his what if it's not in his closet with the door closed? What if it's while he's on his lawnmower while he's driving to work? Barge, what do you think? <laughs> Dave Sims wonders if it's okay to pray outside of his closet. If he can pray on the, in his car on the way to work or while he's uh, So there you go. I, I can't debate. I can't debate with you. All I can do is just refer you to Mark. But I know that the, I know that the idea was. Uh, so Dave, if you're praying on your lawnmower, don't be doing this. <laughs> or don't hold up a sign that says "I'm praying." Look at <laughs> The idea is that the point isn't to be done. To, the point is not to be seen by others. Also, he said that you shouldn't pray like God doesn't know what you need. Because so the pagans would pray on and on and on trying to inform God. Because God was, you know, how would God know what you need if you didn't tell him? Right? God's this far away distant being, so you gotta get his attention by keep going on and on and on to let him know what you need. So Jesus says, not the way to pray. Here is the end of the way to pray. This then is how you should pray. He starts out by saying, our Father. Now let's just think about that a little bit. First of all, he designates, he says, our Father. And I was thinking, okay, not Creator. And sometimes we talk about God as the Creator. The Creator is, it's like a, like a scientist can create something. But just because you created something doesn't mean you necessarily have a parental relationship with what you have created. Also, Jesus does not say, uh, address God as king. Don't pray our king. Not that God isn't a king. Jesus talked about that Jesus had come to bring the kingdom of God on earth. But he didn't say, don't, he said, don't address God as king. Not that he isn't a king. Or don't call him creator. Not that he isn't our creator, but call him Father. And in the original language, he even uses that very special word, that very intimate word for Father, Abba. And what, what are some of the other, that's like Daddy, or 
Papa. You could even sort of hear it, Papa. You know, Papa, Papa, Papa. You know, this is a, uh, I know some people who pray to God and they pray Papa. Because that helps them feel more of that. Um, and then it's our Father. And not just, I've got this personal relationship with you, but this is the God who is equally the Father of everyone, who is our Father. One of my favorite parts of the Bible is the book of Acts, the 17th chapter, and Paul is preaching to the people in Athens. And you remember the people in Athens had all kinds of idols set up. They even had an idol set up to the unknown God. Do you remember this? Do you remember this story? And Paul, Paul's preaching today, and he says, well, let me tell you about this unknown God, that he has been revealed to the world, the world in Christ, that everything, that everything has been set in motion by this God, that everybody comes from this God. And then one of my favorite verses is Acts 17, 28, which reads, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So Paul is preaching to a group of pagans. These are not Jewish people. Group of pagans. And what does he, what does he tell them? This God that you don't know, this God is your father. And he is not far away from you. He's not over there in that temple. He's not way up in the sky beyond your reach. He's right around you. All you have to do is just reach out. And he's wanting you to find him. He's near to you. He is close to you. And he regards you as his own child. Said, and, and Paul said, even to the Greek people, even your own Greek poets know this, that we are his offspring. Now, if you look at this Acts 17, 28, the Greek word for offspring is genos. Now, there's a lot going on right now about genealogies. And we can find out a lot about DNA now, can't we? You can do those tests. Although I did hear a person that, that did four of those tests, and they came back with different, different stuff. So I don't know how accurate all those are, but the idea is that our genomes, our genealogy, goes all the way back to God. We are, Paul was encouraging you to think of God. Also, genos is the same kind. So if you're of the same kind of something, you're of that genos. So what he's encouraging people to think of is you are of the same kind as God. You are a descendant. It's another way to translate it. So Paul says you are children of God. You are descendants of God. God is not far away from you. God is near and close to each one of you. Where do you think that Paul got all these ideas about God? This is the Sunday school answer from Jesus, who presents this God with us, God near to us, God close to us. Now, one of the reasons is our Father, one of the reasons that people have, I think, problems with the idea of God being near to us is that where is our Father? Our Father is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. And where is heaven? Heaven is way, way, way way up there. And so when you pray that, our Father who is in heaven, it can almost sound like our Father who is way up there. So like, Heavenly Father! Like you have to pray, you know, really loud. But in the New Testament, the heavens are not just what's way up there, but the heavens, the Greek word is the uranus, is what surrounds. So where do the birds fly around? In the heavens. The, so the Heavenly Father is not the Father who is up there, but the Heavenly Father is the one who is everywhere. If you're on the earth, you're surrounded by what? The heavens. No matter how high you go, no matter how low you are, where, what is around you? The heavens. And so the Heavenly Father is the one who is near to you rather than the one who is far from you. Uh, there is a... Uh, Christian philosopher named Dallas Willard, theologian philosopher named Dallas Willard, he wrote a book called uh, The Divine Conspiracy, which I read years ago, and he makes this point really well. And uh, he makes just some following observations. 
Remember the book of Acts where Peter, where there's a, uh, Peter has a vision and there's all those animals. Remember, he's, he's been taught all his life and not being unfit animals and then there's the sheep and it, and it comes down and he's told that he, that he doesn't, doesn't have to worry about what kinds of animals he eats for food anymore. Well, if you look at that, the sheep was let down through the heavens. Uh, and in the sheet there were the birds of the heavens and then when he hears he hears a voice from the heavens declaring to him the meaning of what's of what's happening so Willard writes similarly God spoke to Moses from the midst of the fire on Sinai and from above the mercy seat in the tabernacle in each case it was from our air but the ideology that, do, that dominates our education and thought today makes it hard to accept that straightforward fact. Incalculable damage has been done to our practical faith in Christ by confusing heaven with a place in distant outer space. So he thinks the problem is when we think of our Father in heaven and we think of his way up there almost in outer space. But instead of heaven and God as always being present with us, as Jesus shows them to be, we invariably take them to be located far away, most likely at a much later time, not here and not now. And then Willard asks, and should we then be surprised that we feel ourselves alone? So, our Father means that when I call God Father, our Father, meaning the Father of all of us, who surrounds all of us and who loves each one of us, and we should regard ourselves as of a kind of this father, related to this father, a, a descendant of this father. Then the next, the next thing is, hallowed be your name. And they say, the scholars say that this is the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. So, our Father who art in heaven, here's what I want to have. Here's my prayer. I want your name to be hallowed. I want your name to be hallowed. In a way, that's kind of like being respected. I want you to receive the respect and the honor that you are due. One commentator on this text writes, When believers pray, hallowed be your name, they are asking God to be set above us as high and holy, central and important, and so to be God to us and to his people and to his world. The fact that Jesus puts this petition first indicates its priority to him. Our main concern in life should be that God be treated as God. Our main concern in life should be that God be treated as God. And if you think about what motivated Jesus, what powered him in his life, I think that was the central motivation that the Heavenly Father would be known and would be loved and would be treated as God. And Jesus came into the world to help people to know how to do this. Now, uh, I don't know, in, in, in your family, is your first name a name that's full of meaning for you? I mean, now in, in this culture, in this culture, we just get we get we get names. Names because everybody needs a name. And maybe it's family name or something like that. But in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew culture, names were full of all kinds of meaning. And that William Barclay, in his commentary, and this is about how would be your name. Barclay writes, in Hebrew, the name does not mean simply the name by which a person is called, John or James, or whatever the name may be. In Hebrew, the name means the nature, the character, the personality of the person insofar as it is known or revealed to us. That becomes clear when we see how the Bible writers use the expression the psalmist says, those who know your name put their trust in you, Psalm 910. Quite clearly, that does not mean that those who know that God is called Yahweh will trust in him. It means that those who know what God is like, those who know the nature and the character of God, will put their trust in him. The psalmist says, some take pride in the chariots and some in house and horses, but our pride is in the name of the Lord our God. Quite, quite clearly, that does not mean that in a time of difficulty, the psalmist will remember that God is called Yahweh. It means that at such a time, some will put their trust in human and material needs and defenses, but the psalmist will remember the nature and character of God. He will remember what God is like, 
that that will do will give him confidence. Okay. If you don't have a compelling vision of God in your mind, you're very likely not to be very excited spiritually. If you don't have something that is really that is really drawing you forward in your spiritual life, if your idea of God is that God is this distant, judging character who is really mostly kind of annoyed with you, you're probably not going to be that fired up about your spiritual life. But if you believe that God is your perfect, and I mean perfect, Heavenly Father, and not just your Heavenly Father, that everyone's ultimately perfect Heavenly Father, who is loving you with the perfect love, will never give up on you, if that's who you believe God is, then it would be hard to think of that kind of being, or hard to want to talk to that being, you would want to. As I, as I think about what my hope is in life, my fundamental hope is that God is in God, is in the goodness and the purity of God towards me. I think of that as grace. That there's nothing that I can do to earn the goodness of God towards me. That that's something that just comes to me. Anybody who has ever had a good parent understands that you can't earn the love of a good parent. That just comes to you. And it keeps coming to you. And it keeps coming to you. And the more you mess up, the more you find out that it just keeps coming. That you can't stop it. Mess up all you want. You cannot stop the love of a really good parent coming towards you. And I would argue God is the perfect, the ultimate perfect parent whose love endures forever and there is no way that you can shut that love off. There's no way that you, you can stop it. It's, it's unstoppable. It's everlasting. And so our Heavenly Father is not distant. He is not far away. He is not uncaring. He is close to us. As, as any loving and truly good parent. He knows us inside and out. We don't have to tell him what we need because he already knows what we need uh, before we even say it. We don't have to flag him down or get his attention because he's right next to us. He's close to each one of us. Uh, we are his children. We don't have to do anything to become one of his children. We are one of his children. We are descended from him. We're of, of his kind. He loves us intensely and dearly, and he has come in the world in Jesus Christ to show us this truth. And if that doesn't fire you up for 2019, I don't know what will. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, there's a lot in this world that's right up in our face that can make us discouraged. There's just so many problems and troubles that beset us, and when we turn on the TV or listen to the radio, we hear mostly about those kinds of those kinds of things. But the big news for 2019 is that you are the perfect heavenly Father and that you love us intensely and that you're not giving up on us and that you sent Jesus into the world to show us just how, how big and awesome your love is for each one of us. Help us in 2019 not to doubt your love, but to live in your love and to experience your closeness as all we have to do is just reach out just a little tiny bit, and, and you're there. You're in the surrounding heavens. There's nowhere that we can go that you are not. So help us to take comfort in your goodness, and help us just to live our life with you each day this year. We make this prayer to the Heavenly Father in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I would encourage you to uh, look up the Lord's Prayer. You can go online and look up stuff about the Lord's Prayer. Just, I'm going to be going through the Lord's Prayer line by line, so we'll spend four, five, six weeks, however long it takes us to go through all that. But let's just kind of learn the Lord's Prayer. I hear that the little children are learning to do the uh, Lord's Prayer, and, uh, and uh, I don't think it would be a bad idea for us, to, to, for us personally to each do the Lord's Prayer uh, every day. For during this uh, during this time, it seems like a daily prayer. Can we do it now before we forget? <laughs> Let's do it now. We'll do it now just before we forget, and then maybe we'll have you lead us in, after in the closing sermon. How about that? So be, this will be number one. All right. Let's pray for the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 
longer as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not into evil. Yes, is it against us? And lead us not into There's a story about my father-in-law, Roger Collier. There was a, a, a church, little church up by the lake, and he went out to, to he and Bob Reynolds went out to this little church by the lake, and they did a service or something, and Roger said, now let, now let us have the Lord's Prayer. And he couldn't think of it at all. <laughs> Neither could Bob. Neither could Bob. That's the nice part of it. When you're saying the Lord's Prayer with a group of people, even if you blank out or zone out, you know, you can, you can catch up with, with everybody else. Welcome our elder.